<clears throat> well, our <clears throat> passage this morning is uh, Acts chapter 17. And what I'd like to do is, is look at uh, verses 1 through 15. This is Paul's time in Thessalonica, his time in Berea. But the two events are actually tied together, very similar themes, two dramatically different reactions to uh, the ministry of the Word in both of these places. But again, I think both illustrating the point that we want to see this evening is the, the, that the gospel divides, but we want to see, too, that there is a divide that exists between the two kingdoms, and because of that, there is always going to be warfare. We need to count on it. Uh, we need to be, again, uh, those who have counted the costs and who are willing uh, to pay. But also, again, to see some of the methodology, what it is we ought to be doing as we bring the gospel to others. So Acts 17, beginning in verse 1. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, but when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens and received a command for, uh, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our um, edification this morning. <clears throat> now, remember last time we saw how Paul and Silas were able to turn their beatings and imprisonment into a means of protecting the young believers in Philippi and how they might have even submitted to these things for that reason, you know, why they didn't object in the first place, that they were Roman citizens, so they wouldn't have to go through all these things. When the city officials sent their messengers to release them, uh, Paul protested that they were Roman citizens who had been unjustly treated. They insisted that the officials come and offer a public apology, and they did this, the city officials did this, because they were afraid. Now, not only did this clear the gospel um, and open the door to its acceptance, because remember, the, the city basically saw Paul and Silas arrested, beaten, and imprisoned because of the gospel, but it would also protect the believers at Philippi, since if the city officials decided they were going to um, persecute the church, it might make Paul and Silas change their minds about bringing charges against the authorities for their unjust treatment. So basically, Paul and Silas turned the situation around uh, and used it to protect the church. They always put the Lord, His cause, His church, first in their lives and in their ministries, no matter what the cost might be to them personally. And the reason they did that 
It was because they loved Jesus. He had saved them. He had changed their hearts. He had given them this great privilege to suffer on His behalf, and they were willing to do that for Him. And you know, that's what the Lord calls us to do as well, to be willing to share Him and to be willing to suffer for it. No matter what, again, the cost might be to us personally, to love Him in return as He has loved us. Now, this morning we see that this situation in Philippi didn't daunt them at all. They're again moving forward. This time they want to bring the, the, the gospel to the capital city of Greece. They want to establish a church there so that the gospel might reach you know, to the surrounding areas. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly uh, what happened. But again, we have to realize there was a price that they had to be willing to pay in order for something like this to take place. And the reason is because the gospel creates a divide. It doesn't just save, it also hardens. And we need to reckon on both of those results if, again, we are to be faithful in sharing Christ with others. Now, Luke tells us that they were now headed towards Thessalonica. And I want you to notice, first of all, the change that takes place in the pronouns here, because it, it tells us that something has happened, which Luke doesn't really describe. In verse 1, he says, now when they had traveled, we see the use of the third person personal pronoun instead of the first person personal pronoun, we, and that's because Luke is no longer with them. Luke stayed behind in Philippi, and, and that's not unusual. They would leave often, if they could, some one of their party behind in order to establish the church in the truth. In this case, Luke would be that one. But again, Paul and Silas and Timothy travel on. Luke tells us they first traveled through Amphipolis. Uh, the name of the city means around the city. And the reason is because the Strymon River flowed almost entirely around uh, Amphipolis. So it was basically 30 miles southwest of Philippi. Then Luke tells us they went through Apollonia. And as you might suspect, Apollonia was named after the Greek god Apollo. And that's about 32 miles further. Now, it's quite likely they just simply passed through these cities because they were wanting to get to Thessalonica because of the importance of that particular city. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we might tend to think from the size of the letters, because I think we, there's only, what, five, five chapters in one of the letters, three chapters in the other, that, um, you know, that, that Paul wrote to the cities that Thessalonica was a relatively small and unimportant city. But it was actually just quite the opposite. Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. Macedonia is what we call modern-day Greece. It had a population of around 200,000 people. Now, that was a very large city in those days. Sometimes we think Capernaum and some of these other places may have been large metropolitan you know, areas, but they really weren't. They were just small little towns with just a handful of people. But that wasn't the case here. Now, this city was named by Cassander, who was a former king of Macedon, after his wife Thessalonica. Very similar. What's important about that? Well, Thessalonica was the sister of Alexander the Great. But it was also a port city, okay? one of basically three main ports on the Aegean Sea. Corinth, I believe, to the north, Ephesus to the west. They basically shared all the commerce that was taking place on the Aegean Sea. So I think you can see the, the strategic importance of this city for the spread of the gospel. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 1.8 with regard to the success of this endeavor. He says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. Now, this just shows us that when it comes to sharing the gospel, there's nothing wrong with using strategy, right? If you have maybe more than one opportunity to share the gospel and you can only do one, choose the one that has the promise of greater results. You know, he wanted to bring the gospel there because the likelihood that that church would be able to share with the people going in and out would be very high. 
Now, if we had to pick a country to live in in which we might have that same advantage, we might say, well, this is that country, isn't it? There's all kinds of people coming to this country. We don't have to go to, to other countries to share the gospel. There's plenty of people coming here. So we might think of it in those terms. The Lord has placed us in a country that is very metropolitan, you know, cosmopolitan. We've got all these people that are coming from all over the world. We don't even have to leave the country in order to do evangelism, but we do have to speak. We do need to talk about it to others. Now, when they arrived, they immediately went to the synagogue, and this was Paul's methodology. It wasn't. This was his way of working. He knew Messiah was the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and to his children. He knew that God had sent Jesus first to them. That's why Jesus was born in Palestine, after all. And so wherever he went in the Roman Empire, he would always go to the Jew first to bring Jesus to them first. By the way, um, that was a privilege that they had during the time between uh, when Jesus began his ministry, ended his ministry. The apostles began and ended their ministry the time between 30 and 70 A.D. But after that time, I, I do not believe the Jews share that privileged position any longer. When the judgment came in 70 A.D., that privileged position was gone. But the Lord made sure that all the Jews heard and had the opportunity either to receive Jesus or to reject him before 70 A.D. Now, there appears to have been only one synagogue in that city, which indicates that among the 200,000 inhabitants, there really were not that many Jews. But there he spent three Sabbaths reasoning with them from the Scriptures. And I want to notice, I want us to note here his focus. What was he talking to them about? Well, he was talking about the Christ, of course. But look at the specifics. That the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Now, this is the stumbling block for the Jews. Because in spite of Isaiah 53 and other Old Testament passages that clearly present the idea of a suffering Messiah, that idea was foreign to the Jews. They thought, as we know, that he was going to be a military figure who was going to lead them against Rome to freedom. That he was going to reestablish David's kingdom and sit on his throne, not just temporarily, but forever. I mean, think about the Davidic covenant. Think about the promise God made to David that he was going to raise up one of his seed, establish his throne forever. They were looking for somebody who was going to come and do that. Now, if that's the case, he wasn't going to suffer. If he was going to reign forever, he couldn't die. That was the same problem the disciples had, remember, in understanding these things. And since he couldn't die, he certainly wasn't going to you know, rise again from the dead. Now, remember how many times Jesus told his disciples these exact same things and remember how hard it was for them to understand it, how difficult it was, because this was not the expectation. But this is what Paul had to prove to the Jews if he was to show them that Jesus was this Christ that they were expecting. Well, as you might imagine, some of them were persuaded by his argumentation, and we can only imagine what that argumentation was. We don't need to get into it because we know what it is. We're persuaded that Jesus is the Christ. We knew he had to suffer. We know he had to die. We know he had to be raised again. Some were persuaded, some Jews and some God-fearing men and some of the prominent women, because, again, of God's gracious spirit working in their hearts. Remember, we can only give evidence, but the spirit must persuade, and he did persuade some of them. But the point is, most of them were not. The Jews became jealous. They formed a mob. They came after Paul and Silas and Timothy. They went to where they were staying, hoping to find them, which was Jason's house. And when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren in the house uh, before the city authorities and began to accuse them. By the way, I couldn't help but, but notice this as a point of interest. The, the word that Luke here uses here for the city authorities in Thessalonica, okay? Uh, this is one of those terms that we, we heard about in the apologetic series. Remember, uh, R.C. was talking about how, 
many secular historians would disregard Luke because he was using terms saying that these rulers were being called by certain titles and there was no evidence for that. Well, this was one of those particular titles. And for a time, it was not found anywhere in archaeology, leading many scholars to think that Luke was not reliable. But since that time, they have found 17 inscriptions, five of which come from Thessalonica, in which that exact term is used. And that's one of the reasons why we heard Sir William Ramsey, when he set out to disprove Luke, concluded that Luke is one, perhaps the best historian of antiquity. We can trust the Bible. We can trust the record. It is not only, of course, generally reliable, historic record of what took place, but it is the Word of God. Now again, they took Jason, the brethren, they brought them before these city officials. The charge they made against them was this, that those who had, had upset the world, which is basically hyperbole, but you know, getting them stirred up, whom Jason welcomed into his house, and that's the reason why they dragged Jason out and, and the people who were with him, were breaking the law by saying that there is another king besides Caesar, and that is Jesus. By the way, that was a favorite charge that the Jews liked to bring, wasn't it? Because they knew it was a charge that would stick. Here's somebody proclaiming he's king, and we know that within the Roman Empire that is treason. That's the same charge the Jews brought against Jesus when they brought him to Pilate and why Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? The Jews, these Jews, were essentially turning the blessing that God had given to them. He had given them the Messiah, you know, the, the king, and they rejected him. They were turning that into an accusation. And of course, into the crowds or to the crowds, it sounded like rebellion, and it did incite rebellion in the city. Now, as another point of historic interest, one commentator writes this. About this time, Claudius Caesar, who reigned from 89, uh, 49 to 50, expelled the Jews from Rome. And by the way, we're going to see that in chapter 18, and that's in very close proximity to this event here. Uh, because of riots allegedly instigated by Crestus, a probable reference to disputes within the capital's Jewish community over the identity of the Christ. As you can see, Christ was making a stir in the different towns. And the, these references to Crestus are, are basically references to Christ from outside the Bible. There were those proclaiming Christ as king, and it was creating some political upheavals. Now, when they received a pledge from Jason and his companions basically when they received uh, bail, you know, bond money, and also likely an assurance that Paul and Silas would leave the city, they released Jason and the brethren. Now this skirmish appears to have made it very difficult for Paul to return to Thessalonica. We, we read this earlier in, in our service in 1 Thessalonians 2.17, but we brethren having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Now again, showing Paul's desire to come back, but the inability to come back because of this persecution. But I want you to notice who it is that Paul said was behind this. It wasn't just the Jews. It was Satan. We do need to remember, Satan is a very real entity, and he is mobilizing people to act against us. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Actually, the people who would come against us are the people we're seeking to, to save, but they are pawns of the enemy. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual enemies, which is why we need to use spiritual weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual, the Word of God and prayer. We need to use them without them. We cannot win the battle. You know, the war is won. We just simply need to use the weapons God has given to us to win the battles now. Now, it appears uh, also from what Paul wrote that after they left, that person, that, that basically the church 
suffered persecution. There were those who believed, some few Jews and some of the prominent um, God-fearing Gentiles. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 and 15, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. How did they imitate them? He says, For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. So basically, as the Jews in Palestine had persecuted and killed Jesus and also persecuted us and drove us out, the Jews in Thessalonica are persecuting you and you are suffering. Now again, the gospel is what created this divide. It not only separates into two camps, it makes clear which camp everyone is in. You know, that's how we know, is how we respond to the gospel. Well, because of this persecution, because of the skirmish, Paul and Silas, and, you know, they had to leave town relatively quickly, and Timothy, I believe, even though he's not mentioned here. And when they arrived in Berea, 50, uh, 50 miles away, a town of about 6,000, not, not, not small, but not as big as Thessalonica, Notice they didn't hide in a house somewhere, but they immediately went to the synagogue. They were fearless, you know. Wouldn't you like to experience that kind of drive, that kind of courage? But that's what they had because they were doing the work. When you do the work, then you get the power. You don't wait for the power to do the work. It comes through yielding to the Lord. So they went to the synagogue to preach and undoubtedly preached the same message, reasoned in the same way that they did in Thessalonica, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead. But notice the different response. These were more open-minded than the Thessalonian Jews, and they were because of the Spirit's work, perhaps in preparing them, as he did some of those Jews within Palestine that received the Lord Jesus Christ, those that were even present at the birth of Christ and they knew who He was and how they rejoiced in it, or because of the Spirit's working immediately on them at that particular time, they received the Word with eagerness. And they compared even what the Apostle said to the Scriptures. Remembering, of course, Scripture is the ultimate touchstone of truth. It has to square with Scripture or it is not the truth. And as they listened and as they compared, many of the Jews... And a number of the prominent God-fearers believed. So in this case, we have a much more glorious result. Sometimes it's going to be a few, sometimes it's going to be many. But it's the gospel God uses to save. But again, when God's kingdom moves forward, the devil pushes back. And when the Jews in Thessalonica discovered Paul was in Berea, they came out to stop him. So the brethren moved him along again, sent him to Athens where next time we'll find him ministering to the unbelieving philosophers. And when he arrived, he instructed those who accompanied him from Berea to have Silas and Timothy come to him as soon as possible. Now, in closing, I just wanted to make a couple of applications from this. And um, the first one is the, the apologetic, you know, application, which I don't want to spend a great deal of time on except in a more general sense, Okay. Um, the first one is that in sharing the gospel, we obviously need to know our audience, don't we? When Paul ministered to the Jews, he didn't spend any time proving that God existed well, because they already believed that. He didn't spend any time defending the Scripture as the Word of God because they believed that. Rather, he went from that, from what they already believed, to argue for that which they didn't believe that the Christ must suffer, die, and rise again. And, of course, he used the Scriptures to prove that. Now, next week, we're going to see him in Mars Hill with unbelieving philosophers, and he's going to take an entirely different approach because the audience is different. So the point is, whether it's somebody we already know or somebody that we have just met, we need to understand where people are before we can minister to them. We need to know what they know. We need to know what they've heard, what they haven't heard. We need to know what they believe, what they don't believe. 
and then respond accordingly if we're going to bring them to Christ. If they don't believe God exists, start there. If they have a wrong idea of who God is, we need to start there. If they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, then that's where we need to begin. Now, let's not forget that we tend to believe, and maybe for good reason, that most of the people that we encounter do not believe in God. But I was shocked when I heard R.C. Sproul say that really there's only 5% of, I think, our country that actually identify as atheists, at least at the time he did that uh, series. And judging from how old he looks in the series, I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't a, a great deal of time ago. So many people believe that God exists, but they have an entirely wrong idea of who He is. And I think we should also expect most of the people we run into not to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. As a matter of fact, R.C. was telling us that a majority of people within the evangelical world believe that the Bible is really not the Word of God, or they say it is, but yet they believe it contains errors. They believe it is the Word of God that errs, okay? That God errs somehow, but yet they don't want to believe that, but yet that's somehow what they believe. So we need to be ready to defend the Bible as well so that we can correct them. By the way, if they have a wrong view of God, unless you're really well-versed in natural theology, you need to be able to prove it from the Bible, but you're not going to be able to correct them from the Bible unless you can first get them to accept and respect the Bible. So that's why we need to be able to work in both realms. I think it's also helpful to have at least a basic idea of what the dangerous views are that are held by some Christian denominations. I think a couple of the um, most dangerous views that I can think of is the easy believism view, just pray the prayer and you're on your way to heaven, doesn't matter how you live. Or this subjectivity, this subjectivism of the charismatic churches that tend to follow what they feel rather than what the Word of God says. Those are very dangerous beliefs. We need to be ready to help them as well. You know, um, J. Gresham Machen, the one who is basically credited as the founder of the OPC, he basically said, as Christians, we have two duties. One is to lead our neighbor who is in absolute darkness to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're all familiar with that. But he said our second duty is to lead the Arminian to a true understanding of the Bible. So that, that's something else, because as long as people believe Arminianism, they're going to fall into these very dangerous beliefs. And as Augustus Top Lady, of course, argued against uh, John Wesley, they're also going to rob God of some of his glory. So if we're interested in God's honor, we're going to want to make sure that other believers believe the right things. And of course, it goes without saying, it would certainly be to our advantage to at least know the basic belief system of the cults. We need to know where people are. I mean, I, I think about the time when in, in my ignorance as a young believer, on my delivery route that I used to do, I used to run into Jehovah's Witnesses all the time, and, and they were not quite so upfront about the differences between us, and I didn't know what they were. And I'll tell you what, it made it very difficult for me to try to help that individual because he wasn't going to tell me, and I had no idea, so I had to find out. So let's learn at least basically what they believe so we can bring the Bible to bear on them. Okay. We need to be willing to ask questions to learn. And we need to be ready to offer biblical truth to help them. And then secondly, so first of all, we need to know our audience. Secondly, let's not forget that the truth always produces two results. Okay? It will soften some, but it will harden others. And by the way, it's going to harden many more people than it softens. There is real spiritual warfare that is ongoing. So as we share the gospel, are there going to be people who get upset with us? <laughs> well, of course there are. I mean, look at what happened to Paul. Look at what happened, you know, in every city where he went. And it wasn't just the Jews. I mean, think of the Jews as people in the church. And you share with them, you try to correct them, you try to give them the truth, you try to do it in a gracious way, in a loving way. They're still going to get upset with you. 
And think about the people who are outside, like the Gentiles, like, you know, which we were once outside the church. They're going to get upset with us as well. We need to bank on that. We need to know that's going to happen. But we also need to realize this, that when somebody gets upset with us, it doesn't mean that we didn't do it well enough. We didn't do it the right way. We didn't do it lovingly enough. If I had done it the right way, well, then everything would have come out just right. Well, that isn't true. I mean, who is it that did it the right way always without fail? Jesus, right? And who hated, I mean, who was more hated than Jesus? Was it because <clears throat> he did it the wrong way? He wasn't loving enough? No. It's because there are two kingdoms and there are people in the other camp and they hate the light. And when you shine the light on them, it's going to rankle them. They're going to get upset. It's because of the camp that person is in. That's the reason why they respond to us no matter how we do it. So don't be discouraged if that happens. Realize it's, it's going to happen. And realize as well that if we're ever going to help those individuals that need Christ, that we need to use the spiritual weapons that God has provided. We need to use His truth. And we need to pray. And we need to trust that it's the Lord who's going to bring them to faith in Him. It's not going to be us. Okay? We may argue, we may present evidence and truth as though it does depend on us, but ultimately it depends on the Lord. So we need to look to Him and trust in Him for the results. Well, let's, uh, let's take a moment, shall we, and bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard this morning.